uh, Shota Hori of uh, Japan, who a lot of people uh, were tipping into their teams. But I've just about gone with Tolu Latu. Uh, they've been scrapping hard to find a first-choice hooker since the retirement of Stephen Moore. But I think Latu has been one of their best performers over the last year. So a couple of tries in the World Cup. 39 runs for 173 metres, the most by a hooker in the tournament. And a 95% tackle rate, 20 out of 21, uh, is why I've gone with Tolu Latu at hooker. At uh, tight head prop, Kyle Sinkler. Always playing on the edge. At times in that quarterfinal against uh, Australia, it looked like uh, Sinclair probably could even have been hauled off before half time. He was starting to heat up, but then we saw the best of him after half time in that game. A beautiful try, and one of the players that came of age against New Zealand in the semi final. And his absence in the World Cup final really, really was telling. Uh, and three offloads as well during the tournament. Uh, you're probably not going to see that many from a tight head prop. In the second row, uh, a couple of contenders have missed out Alan jones Courtney Laws uh, but I've gone with Maro Atoji at number 4 the complete player I think and one of the real emerging leaders in that England team seems to have cut down on the indiscipline as well 26 line out wins in the tournament second most by any player and that includes 3 steals and 71 tackles over the course of the tournament which is the most by anyone uh, and I'm going to put him alongside South Africa's Lou Diager uh, unfortunately he had to come off in the first half with a bad shoulder injury in the final but second most carries in metres by a prop or by a lock sorry 32 carries for 157 metres uh, 96% tackle rate and 24 line at wins two of those stolen against the head as well in the back row at six, I'm going to go with Tom Curry, one of the uh, one of the nominees for World Player of the Year. The 21 year old, still just 20, 21, and uh, incredible to think England have spent so many years looking for a brilliant open side flanker. Now they've found two, and even though Curry is naturally an open side, he was playing at number six in this tournament, uh, sharing the back row duties with Sam Underhill. At seven, I think you have to go with Peter Steph Dutot. Uh, we were told years ago uh, that he wasn't good enough to be a test uh, a test flanker and here he is world player of the year deservingly so already a contender for player of the tournament before the final he was absolutely brilliant in the uh, decider against England as well and uh, a team high 61 tackles shows just how effective he was for South Africa in defence and then at number 8 Dwayne Vermeulen man of the match in the final his individual battle with Billy Vunipola was probably one of the most anticipated individual battles in that game 11 carries for almost 50 metres in the final as well an absolutely brilliant haul out of him to scrum half um, I have just about gone beyond Faf de Klerk I know a lot of people were uh, choosing him and their team in the tournament. I, though, I've gone with Aaron Smith of New Zealand. He just edges it past Faf de Klerk for me. Uh, I think he gave us moments of brilliance. I think uh, Faf de Klerk was really, really strong in what he did. He kicked brilliantly. But I just think Aaron Smith gave us these individual moments, uh, brilliant tries. His performance against uh, Ireland in the quarters was, I think, the complete scrum half performance. And that, for me, is why he just about... Uh, Pips Faf de Klerk uh, to the scrum half position. At out half, um, this was a tough one, I think, because I don't think there were any real standout performers at out half in this tournament. A lot of, a lot of out halves had good tournaments. Uh, Andre Pollard was very, very good, but steady, I think, without doing anything spectacular. Owen Farrell and George Ford swapped around a little bit, and again, both struggled in the final, which just about drew them away from me. Richie Mwanga, New Zealand, was decent enough as well. You look at Wales, Dan Bigger had a couple of injury problems during the tournament, so he was in and out a bit and wasn't able to kind of get the consistent minutes. So I've gone with Yu Tamura of Japan, who I think really made their backline work. Japan, uh, after South Africa, really the story of the tournament and played such brilliant rugby. And I think Yu Tamura did such brilliant work to, to get that backline working. Uh, he really was the heartbeat, I think, of... Um, an incredible Japan team to watch. Uh, on the left wing, I think you have to go with the top try scorer in the tournament, Josh Adams, the first Welsh selection in this. Uh, top try scorer, seven tries in total, including a hat-trick in one of those games as well. And he is fast becoming one of the most lethal finishers in the game. At first centre, uh, what I think a lot of Munster fans will be hoping is going to be a soon-to-be Munster player, Damien De Allende. Uh, 65 carries the most for South Africa in the, tor in the tournament and the fourth most by any player in the tournament. 165 post-contact metres, which is the fourth most by a player as well. And that is a really crucial stat, just how much work he gets done 
after the tackle, how many extra yards he's able to pick up uh, once the contact is made. And also in defence, the fourth highest tackle count for any South Africa player as well. And the thought of himself and Chris Farrell in a, in a Munster centre next season is uh, really, really exciting. At second centre, it's probably the most controversial choice. I've copped out a little bit, I am willing to admit, because I've gone for a winger. I was stuck between Josh Adams, uh, this man, and our other winger. And in the end, I've gone with Kenki Fukuoka of Japan in the centre. Yes, he plays on the wing, but this is a hypothetical team. This doesn't have to make sense. These guys are never actually going to be on the pitch at the same time. So you don't have to point out the tactical reasons why Fukuoka doesn't have to be in this. But 29 runs for 250 metres, four tries, seven clean breaks, 12 defenders beaten, three offloads, and his individual performance against Scotland, one of the highlights of the tournament, uh, for me anyway. Uh, I know some other contenders in there, Lafayette uh, was one of them, Manu Tuilangi was another. I just think he was quietened that little bit in the final. And that's what just about is why I'm leaving him out of the team and going with Fukuoka. And then on the other wing, Semi Randrandra of Fiji. The only player in this group not to make it out of the pools. And even though he didn't make it out of the pool, he still probably was one of the best players in the entire tournament. Two man of the match awards during that. The highest number of metres made, 546 metres from 52 carries, four try assists, five line breaks. What an absolutely sensational player he is. And I know there are some people who have suggested to me in the last day or so, you could have just put Randrandra in the centre and put Fukuoka out on the wing. I will put my hands up and say that probably does make a bit more sense than what I've done. But look, it's a hypothetical team. And lastly then, Bowden Barrett. Is this his new home at fullback? I think New Zealand potentially have uh, found something here. 51 runs for 481 metres. The second most by any player Granted, New Zealand didn't win the tournament, but that experiment of Richie Mwanga at 10 and Bowden Barrett at fullback really does look like it worked. So here's the team in full up on your screen. At a loose head prop, Tendayam Tauria. We've got Tolu Latu of Australia at hooker. Kyle Sinclair at tight head prop. Uh, Maro Atoji and Lou Diager in the second rows with Tom Curry, Peter Steftutot and Dwayne Vermeulen in the back row. At a scrum half, Aaron Smith alongside Yu Tamura of Japan. In the centres, we've gone with Damien Dialende and Kenki Fukuoka with Semi Randrandra, Josh Adams of Wales and Bowden Barrett of New Zealand at full back. So I've gone five South Africans, three English players, two from New Zealand, two from Japan, one from Wales, one from Fiji and one from Australia as well. So get your comments into us on across all of our social channels. You can get us on Twitter, at Off The Ball. We're streaming on YouTube as well right now. We'll get the best of those tallied up together and Owen Sheen's going to come in a little bit later on and uh, we're going to talk through some of those choices and uh, the selections other people have given uh, and you can tell me just how wrong I am and how useless I am at this job. Now, with me at the moment, I'm delighted to say he's 2007 World Cup winner with South Africa, former Munster and Ulster prop BJ Botha. BJ, thanks a million for joining us this afternoon. Three days on from the final, still celebrating? How are you doing, Neil? Yeah, still celebrating, I suppose. Um, in our little, uh, I suppose, in our kind of own uh, zone, really. Um, South Africa's going a little bit, obviously, crazy and uh, imminently probably going to go even more crazy when the players arrive. But, um, yeah, a good example would be on the weekend when our children were kind of looking at myself and my wife asking, why are you going so crazy when the final whistle blew, you know, and to put it in perspective. And then we kind of had to explain to them, you know, they've all been born in Ireland. So, yeah, just massive for us. And uh, being South Africans, you know, we couldn't be prouder. So your kids then, do they, do they consider themselves little mini box at heart? Or do you consider well, them look, little mini box? Uh, Look now, they'd be wearing the Irish jersey and the, and the Springbok jersey together. So, and they've got uh, quite quite thick country accents. So, um, I think they'd be supporting Ireland, to be honest. Now, uh, South Africa obviously generally like they're among everyone's favourite picks going into a tournament. But this time it was a little bit different because they've had to come from quite a low a low ebb two years ago when things looked as bad as they'd ever really been for South Africa in recent times. And Razi Erasmus has come in. What has he done in this last couple of years to bring them from where they were, like, I mean, towards the latter stages under Alistair Kutsia, they were really struggling, hammered by Ireland, for example, two years ago in Dublin. Just six members of that team that started that game against Dublin start a World Cup final. How has Razi gone about transforming that team? Yeah, you're right. I think coming into a World Cup, um, you know, I think they probably were in the probably in the best position. You just want to, um, I suppose, stay behind those stay behind those lines uh, from a from a from a World Rugby perspective. I think they were coming in fourth in the world in the rankings, or 
um, you know, and they even probably dropped lower at some stage. And um, I suppose not directly in that firing line, uh, but what we didn't know is something really building from from underneath, you know. And, uh, you know, Rusty being the taskmaster there is, uh, you know, coming through the ranks, you know, he's been an expert in a, a analysis over the years. You know, he was, you know, uh, a bit involved in the 2007 campaign and then building his time with the Free State winning, winning trophies there and then obviously coming to Munster. You know, and I think he's just got that foresight with him and Jacques really, uh, planning a, a squad that believes they can first and foremost, you know, do the business and then putting putting together a squad that are on form, a good mix of experience and youth, and then kind of building that through that period. I think you'll see the games that happened and the, the, the games that were played in the championship and, you know, using different combinations and using that platform to hopefully have them, have them do what they did uh, this past weekend. You mentioned like he's had an involvement in 2007 as well. How closely would you have worked with him? Uh, and what would you kind of seen of him to kind of understand the type of coach and person he is? Yeah, look, I don't want to give away my age now, but I played against <laughs> Rossi. <laughs> and so we had fond memories there, um, you know, in the Curry Cup. And uh, so, yeah, look, and, and, and for sure, um, you know, Rossi has been coming through the ranks and always been really an intelligent you know, coach and, and really, a, uh, I suppose, a coach that the youngsters, uh, you know, looked up to. And I think that's what he's kind of got this this youngish squad to to believe. It, as I said, it is a mix, uh, you know, of the of the of of, of experience and, and youth and obviously players that are on form. But um, yeah, look, he's a, he's a, he's 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 a top coach, and uh, uh, I'm not surprised, obviously, what he's done with the squad. Um, obviously, it's, it's 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 tough to get there to, to that top pinnacle where they've just uh, arrived. But uh, I'm not surprised that they that they went out like they did. And obviously, as well, I, I'm, you know things are going quite well for Munster at the moment. But I'm sure there are Munster fans who've watched it at the weekend, going, "God, what if Razi Erasmus hadn't been poached by South Africa? You know, what could he have done with this team?" Granted, Johan van Gran is doing a, a perfectly fine job. And it looks like with the potential couple of signings coming into Munster that, you know, things can only get better as well. But I'd ima I imagine there are a lot of Munster fans out there right now thinking, God, what if Razzie had stayed? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But I, did th I do think he left it in a great place. You know, he really brought through those kind of uh, young players coming through that are now performing for, for Munster. Whether he contracted... Um, whether he contracted, uh, partially, you know, involved in contracting the right recruitment of players, probably played a, a part in there. So he's kind of, I suppose, one part Munster legacy, you know, will continue. And, and he's really rubbed off on a lot of players here. You know, the guys that are obviously a, uh, part of the Irish squad uh, probably met up with him in Japan and, you know, how he's rubbed off on them on their career. And, yeah, of course you can look back, but that's pro sport, you know. I think he left it in a, in a, in a better place than he found it. And, uh, you know, he went on to obviously achieve his goal. Mm -hmm. um, see, a Khaleesi story is obviously one that has resonated with a lot of people. I think it shows just how far not just South African rugby has come, but South Africa as a country as well. Yeah, of course. I don't think you can write a better script, you know. Um, just really someone coming from, as he said uh, in one of his uh, write-ups, uh, watching the 2007 final in a tavern and really building through. Um, I spoke last week briefly on on radio just talking about uh, you know the kids in South Africa living a dream really and this shows clearly that pathway that they can go you know um, if they do the hard work and and have that belief I suppose that that the that the World Cup side had and you know this really is ingrained in us you know this is an unbelievable uh, um, a great day incredible day for Springback rugby but for me it's even a bigger day for the for the country um, you know that just rugby resonates throughout every part of South Africa and those for those 80 minutes uh, you know that, that that was on 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 the weekend. Really, I think uh, everyone is everyone is just focused on on that. And obviously, with, with things to come, I think the guys are just going to ride that wave. You know, and hopefully, we'll continue and they, and they, and and they build on this. So um, it's really exciting for me from a rugby perspective in South Africa. Would have changed much what's going on at the moment. Um, you know, I think it will it will aid in that. Um, but yeah, it's just something great uh, for South African rugby. And, and and obviously, especially for you know for the people, on the game itself, everyone talked up England coming into it, and I think that was probably natural based on the way they just took apart New Zealand. Um, did you buy into that hype around England? Were you quietly confident for South Africa going into it? 
Yeah, look, I, I look back now, and I was I was quietly confident, uh, you know, even even being uh, obviously a South African. But I felt that uh, you know England had played their final against against New Zealand. Really, I suppose the, the way they came and the way they dominated that game, everything just went their way, you know. So coming off Australia and then obviously beating New Zealand like they did, I felt it was going to be really tough for them. Uh, to kind of uh, match up even to South Africa because I felt that South Africa's physicality was even a, a quite a step ahead of, of, of New Zealand's and they'd be testing them in areas that they haven't been tested before. So, you know, those, co- you know, converging on each other, I think it was going to be very difficult for them. However, I think that kind of expectation from an English perspective probably played in the Springboks' hands. They came out there and knowing what they needed to do and, you know, with one or two things happening early in the game, um, it rattled uh, England even more. Uh, which just really uh, played uh, played in South Africa's hands, and they just built on that. Yeah, I think for for South Africa, getting off to a good start was obviously huge because England have a habit over the last 12 months of starting these big games absolutely brilliantly. They have a fantastic try scoring record in the opening 10 minutes. I think it's nine tries in the first 10 minutes of games in against Tier One sides this uh, this calendar year. So for South Africa to make a good start and to get the territory. And even to get a penalty, granted they missed it inside the opening minutes, but just to st- to kill any early English momentum just felt like a huge thing at the time. Yeah, definitely. I suppose that that is one hundred percent. The start was going to be massive. You know, we saw our, our England did start against New Zealand, and that gave them belief. And it was just being in the back of their heads. You know, South Africa with the start they had. Um, you know, even as you said, uh, it wasn't converted, but that pressure was there. You know, and then obviously we just waited for that. Uh, you know, first crumb to um, to happen, and that kind of is the is the area, and, and including the mall where we see some physical, you know, kind of um, almost a marker being laid down from South Africa. Yeah, that really was laid down by the South African pack, and in particular the scrum. Um, did it just show how valuable the scrum is? Because we had Ron Nogara in here on Sunday, and he was making the point that you do have a lot of people out there who kind of. They don't really like the scrums. They find them boring. They find the resets boring. They think it should be more like rugby league, a lot more ball and play. Um, but it just shows how valuable the scrum is. Like South Africa won six penalties in those opening 50 minutes off the scrums. Nine of their first 18 points came directly from penalties at the scrum. And those nine points eventually just gave them the cushion to go on and score those tries in the last 20 minutes. Yeah, there could just not be a better adver- advertisement for the scrum you know, um, you know, on, on on the weekend, really, it just showed what a massive part it is on the game. You know, for me, um, it's it's also the the man in the middle let that flow. You know, he made those calls. Um, I suppose, and 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 the, and the dominance did show there. But from a set piece perspective, it's just huge in a final. You know, that's where you kind of start off your moves. You can kind of play your territory off that, and that's what played into South Africa's hands. You know, they just couldn't get any any in, inroads. You know, Vili Leru was as solid as can be. Um, and people talk him up, uh, um, you know, during the previous weeks that it, that they needed to change him, but he just showed his kind of experience in the final. Uh, Fuff de Klerk had a great platform to kick off, and Dwayne and these guys carrying were carrying on, you know, you know, front football. Never mind the penalties, which just obviously increased that pressure on them. So, you know, from a from a dominance perspective, it just really overflows to every part of the game. A scrum. Guys are guys coming off a scrum, you know, retreating at that rate are basically thinking about that for the next. For the next minute, trying to think about, well, I just want to put that right for the next scrum. I can't wait, and then they kind of, you know, face the face the same onslaught. And we did see, obviously, England have one 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 good scrum there, but I think uh, by that stage, uh, South Africa had tasted blood, and they were coming every time. You know, I might get your opinion on kind of both sides of you know being on that scrum battle, like you know when you are on top and when you are going backwards. When you're getting those decisions and when you're sending your man backwards in a scrum. Like how how powerful does it make you feel? How much confidence does it give you just to your all round game for the rest of the match? Yeah, from a tight five perspective, it's just huge confidence. You're coming off a scrum, whether you whether you're getting the penalty or whether you're obviously moving forward in the scrum, they are retreating down the huge strain. It's just overflowing to every part of your game, your physical part of it in the in in the defence and in the attack. And you know their mindset was quite quite uh, shown quite early how they want to keep in the ball. And you know. If you if you kind of just really I suppose match up and just hope that you match up one scrum with them and they could basically play the ball and give yourself a chance in defence, then you you know that'll be a great uh, opportunity. But but they don't. They're keeping it in. They're applying that pressure and you're just really holding on from then on. 
And then on the flip side, you could see from an English point of view that once they started going backwards in the first few scrums, it almost felt like with every knock on and with every little mistake that led to another to another scrum, you could just see the body language of the English players. It almost felt like they were they were kind of preparing to concede a penalty. They knew they were under enormous amounts of pressure. Yeah, for sure. And you're looking around to kind of, I suppose, as fix as, as soon as possible on the field because these guys are seasoned pros, you know, and looking around and what can you really do there? And it's, it's, it's really is uh, nothing much you can do there from that side of the dominance. The dominance was, you know, such a massive impact there that the guys were looking around and, 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 and basically even on defense trying to get the ball out to Billy. And, and, and we know when... When, when 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 kind of eighth men and and the nines are looking good, you know the pack is dominating. So they were up and up against a, a massive battle there, and it just as I said from a from a defensive perspective on the English side, it just overflowed into every other part of their game. And um, they were on the back foot from then on. Whether it was a penalty and the guys converting the points and just keeping that scoreboard ticking on, or really just um, you know in 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 open play. How much sympathy would you have for a man like Dan Cole in that situation? Like coming on three minutes into a game in a World Cup final, there aren't too many props uh, props tight or loose these days, or even a hooker, who are playing more than 50, 55 minutes in a, in a big test match. So for him to have to come on three minutes into the game and knowing the strength that South Africa have on the bench, that once the, once the beast is kind of, once he's emptied the tank, that Stephen Kitchoff is ready to come in and just go at him at all, all over again. How much sympathy do you have for a player like Dan Cole in that situation? Yeah, I think mentally you're just, you know, kind of thinking you're on the bench and you're going to get 20, 30 minutes here and, and, and your mindset is not there. I think that's the biggest thing, your your mindset, you know. And so when, you, when you're coming onto the field and you basically think, let me just kind of warm up my, I wouldn't say warm up myself, you're probably warm from the warm up, but basically get the scrum over and you, you know, you get pushed backwards at that rate of knots, it really does shock you. I don't, for me, from my opinion, I don't think it would have been different if Sinclair was on the field. I, I thought Cole was more so this, the, the more specialist scrummaging side of things, where I thought Sinclair was the bigger, pa- uh, kind of the fuller package as, as, as a Tati that that gave England a lot of opportunities from a ball running and from a defensive perspective. Um, I still feel that you know that that the South African uh, pack and, and scrum was going to be superior in the in the in, in the scrum and the more. But yeah, from a, from a mindset and from Cole's perspective, I did you know there's nowhere to hide then. You know you don't even have someone to change off the bench. You know he's kind of there for the rest of the game. And um, you look, he, he, he had one good scrum there, but it was going to come down that, that channel the whole day. And you know, um, as a tight head, uh, when, when, when a scrum tastes, tastes blood, it, it takes a huge effort to reverse that. You know, you really need to have a, a knock on. I think if England maybe had another good scrum after that, it might have brought it to a, a level you know, playing field in South Africa. might have thought of playing the next one off the scrum base, but uh, they just didn't do enough to counter that. Despite the fact that South Africa pretty much dominated the game and laid from start to finish throughout it, um, with 15 minutes to go before Mapimpi's try, it was pretty still, much, still just like a six-point game. Granted, South Africa were comfortable in that lead, but was there any part of you still feeling, you know what, it is only a six-point game, this can change dramatically at any stage? Yeah, for sure. Even, even after Mapimpi's try, I think the only time he really settled was after Colby's try, really. And that was kind of seven minutes to go or six minutes to go. We all know what can happen in rugby. And we all know the danger of England, you know. They're not in the finals for no reason. So they can be scoring tries within five minutes. They'll score two tries, you know. Um, so there's so, so there's no doubt about that, you know. It's a final. And and we all, everything from, from you know, maybe at one part, uh, a hard tackle and a yellow card changes the game completely. And as we've seen with the, with the substitutions that happened, even the first half, losing Manambi and then Lurt de Yaga, um, even though he's, their replacements were were, 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 were unbelievable. Um, and that's the way Rusty worked his, his, his bench. Um, it was just really um, not taken for granted until, for me, Colby scored that try and we then started, you know, kind of, I suppose, celebrating. Yeah, and then, like, I mean, the issue now, I think, for South Africa going forward is... I just want to kind of get your thoughts on how much of a how much of an issue is the drain of players in South Africa going over up into Europe and playing with the, the European clubs because we're seeing it more and more now. There are a few more that have left since the end of this World Cup. In the long term, can it have damaging effects? Because, you know, I watch Super Rugby and you'd see a game in South Africa and the crowds are really low because the best players aren't out there playing. 
is is that something that can have a, an effect on South Africa going forward? Yeah, I think it can have effects, but I think Russell got that right. You could see the mix of a foreign, I mean, sorry, not foreign, but uh, overseas-based players being recruited and being allowed to be recruited. And there's a couple of, uh, there's a couple of, um, um, you know, kind of uh, things that have been changed uh, in South Africa where a Springbok can be selected if he's got over 50 tests in certain in certain areas. Um, but on the other side, it can also benefit a benefit, um, you know, the, the Springboks at the same time playing in the same leagues with a lot of the international players they're going to be playing against England, Ireland, um, and you know, mixing that up with basically having maybe a possibility of having the local guys that are staying in South Africa uh, being part of an end of year tour, an incoming tour, uh, seeing how you play the rugby championship, and then all looking likely, which we see now is, is, is Rusty really building up to the. 2021 Leinster, which is probably the next big one for them. But it's always been a worry that player drain. You know, the the, the markets in South Africa can't can't compete with that. But I think the brand of 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 of, of, of the Springboks is is is, 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 is as strong as can be. And and you know there needs to be other reasons uh, for the guys um, you know to stay. And this and this win now will be a lot of the guys' reasons to stay and remain to be part of this. You know, mm-hmm. and to not just to leave for financial. Uh, purposes uh, or for, 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 for other reasons. Um, one other issue as well, I think, and it's an issue, I suppose, in the global game, but having had a, a Springbok International suspended for doping in the year of a, World Cup says, uh, of a World Cup success, do you think there's a responsibility on South Africa now to, to use their title as world champions to kind of tackle the doping problem in world rugby and indeed in South Africa as well, because that is where we're seeing a lot of positive tests come out, particularly with younger players as well. Can they use and should they be using their kind of World Cup win as a responsibility and as a way to kind of challenge this and move forward? I think the responsibility is really worldwide, really, with the world organisation, working with the the countries and with the teams involved. I think we obviously um, see now it was really, um, you know... um, I think uh, from a staffing perspective, um, when 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 we had this uh, test um, uh, positive, uh, it, it was tough. I think you know, kind of guys that are leading into a World Cup and planning this, and uh, I think the effects then on that, um, you know. But I think we we need to continue to be working on that. You know, I think it's been um, the fact that um, we need constant um, organisations such as the World Drug Drug Institute to be keeping kind of an eye on this. You know, it's 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 tough to put your finger on on it um, accurately. Um, for me, um, it's a world kind of. Um, I suppose the world teams, uh, the international teams, need to be working together with 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 Wada. You know, um, we've had tons of comments coming in for you here, BJ. A lot of monster, no a lot of monster and Ulster fans who are uh, delighted to see you. This one here from uh, Tom in County Derry says, BJ, very much still loved in Ulster, and I'm sure monster too. I brought my two kids along who were nine and eight at the time their first Ulster game and BJ came over to the two lads after to take a photo when everyone else was rushing down the tunnel sound man says Tom in Derry uh, Carlin Limerick says a man of the people BJ who was uh, the bigger voice in the dressing room Ron Nogara or Paul O'Connell yeah um, look they were both when they when they did speak kind of everyone listened put it that way so they didn't really yeah. have that need to be that bigger voice you know they were there in, uh, enough just to kind of be there in the changing room. They made you feel really settled. And when they did speak, people listened. And it was it was not a lot of talk, you know. In the change room, especially before you're running out, there's not much said, you know. Um, you've done all the work. But uh, both of them would have said a few words, you know. And I know, you know, Paulie with the forwards obviously spoke with us. But usually, um, Rod would have the last few words before we ran out and uh, it, it was something really that we um, you know took with us a uh, couple of last ones then a horse of a man but a gentleman BJ Botha always made time for the fans says Sean in Limerick City and lads I'm a Leinster fan and even I was jealous of Munster and Ulster when BJ played for them not just a great player but easily one of rugby's best characters that's from Connor in Meath so uh, that's a nice boost for your ego now Cheers, BJ Connor. Botha you can go about your day thanks a million for joining us this afternoon and uh, I hope you enjoy the World Cup success even more Cheers, appreciate it. Huh? All the best. BJ both are there speaking to us about uh, the Springboks Rugby World Cup success. Now, in the next few minutes, Owen Sheehan is going to call into studio to uh, 
join us. We're going to run through some uh, some more text messages in reaction to uh, South Africa's win and the team of the tournament. And Owen, of course, who was out there, we might get his thoughts on uh, some of his highlights from uh, throughout the last couple of months. Before that, though, we're just going to play you a little clip. Here's Matt Williams, who was on Monday Night Rugby last night, speaking about the impact Razzy Rasmus had on the Springbok side since coming in a couple of years ago. You know, what Razzy's done, not just technically, tactically on the field, he's united that team off the field. You know, his Khaleesi, the selection of Khaleesi as captain is hugely symbolic in Africa to have, have a black uh, captain of the, of the Springbok. It, it, it's an amazing um, choice by Rassi. And obviously that has united the team. Because you have to, if, if you're a South African coach, you have to tread the line as well of politics because um, there's usually an ANC appointee on the staff. Mm. I know for a fact from coaches in the past have told me that when you make a change, a black player comes off and you don't put a black player on, you, you are asked your reasons why. So we're players, like as a coach, we don't see players colour, I don't see their sexuality, their politics, you just see if they're playing well or not. But in South Africa, a lot of that is seen, even when it's it's not meant to be seen. Mm. So Rassi has done more than just uh, unify that side. He's, he's walked the line of the politics that has to come with every national team in South Africa, be it cricket or rugby, that were the, the symbolisms of the old uh, or the symbols of the old regime. And he's, he's unified that. And that is not easy to do. Matt Williams there speaking on Monday Night Rugby last night about uh, South Africa's World Cup win and how they've turned it around over the last couple of years. Still loads of messages coming in on BJ Botha. A lot of love for him. I'm going to read out a couple more. BJ is gone though. Um, a boy the BJ. A few good nights being planned in Limerick City over the next few weeks with the lead up to Christmas. Let us know when you're around and we'll hit Flannery's, Claws and wherever the drink takes us. That's from Cahill and all the young Munster lads. Uh, good man, Cahill. Um, <laughs> Everyone knows everyone down in Limerick. Oh. <laughs> uh, the Bothas and the Flannerys and the whoever, they're all, they're all one family exactly. when it comes to Limerick. Oh, I mean, there's about five Flannery pubs in Limerick. I was thinking, which one is it? Is it that is, this particular that, that's, offer? that's the best one. He'll know. I've always found in Limerick, there's like four or five of them in Limerick City. Someone says to you, I'm going to Flannery's, meet me there. You just, you just know which one he's, he's talking about. By the tone. Just the tone, yeah. Yeah, and they're all very close <laughs> together as well. It makes it really, really difficult. But um, I'm getting your thoughts on some text coming in because I did my uh, my team of the tournament. Oh, yeah? Have we'll, a look we'll, run through, we'll run through it actually again if we can get the, the picture back <laughs> up. So in the front row, I went for uh, the Beast, Tendam Tauria. I went Tolilatu of Australia at hooker, Kyle Sinclair at tight head prop, Maro Toji and Lou Diager in the second rows with Tom Curry and Peter Steff de Twat on uh, the uh, flanks and Dwayne Vermeulen at number eight. Aaron Smith, I went over Faf to Clerk at, out at scrum half. Uh, Yu Tamura of Japan at out half. The wings then Josh Adams and Semi Randrandra. And then in the centre, I went Damien De Allende. And I went with Kenki Fukuoka of Japan. Mm. Granted, he played all his games on the wing. I went with him in the centre. But I went for the, uh, I went for the all-stars approach where it doesn't necessarily matter where he actually played. I'm going to squeeze him in anyway because I want him in the team. And uh, then at fullback, I went for Bowden Barrett. As a man who put together an entire series of GA power rankings over the last <laughs> year on OTBM, how do you deal with criticism? Get ready for the backlash, basically. Embrace the backlash, own the backlash, is, is, all, I, is all I can really say. Like a strong umbrella to deal with the... The torrential rain that's coming to, coming, you coming need, your way? Yes, and you need wellies and you need a big jacket and you need to be able to, to prepare for the torrent. Uh, it, it's interesting. You wouldn't have thought this time one week ago that Sam Underhill wouldn't be getting into a team of the tournament, but I guess it kind of is fair enough that that's changed in the in the space of the performance from uh, from South Africa and from Detroit. And, yeah, and like it, was, it was basically two of Underhill, Curry and uh, Detroit. So just about went with Curry and Dutout. Can we get the team back up on screen again yeah, there? Yeah, we'll put it up uh, back up there. It's my, my first time uh, seeing it, so it's... Uh, now, the criticisms I'm getting is uh, this, for example, from Mr. Trevor O. Surely Faf de Clerc gets in, world's best nine. I just thought Aaron Smith gave us a few better moments, the individual moments. Like, I don't think Faf de Clerc did anything spectacular for me. Whoa. He was... He was he was very good and very consistent throughout and ran games very well, but I think the way Aaron Smith just like dismantled Ireland in the quarterfinals for an example for an example. Uh, you two more at ten? Yeah, 
I, I didn't think it was a vintage tournament for out halves. No, that's but that was actually my next point. Is I think that probably shows I was, up. Yeah, I was chatting it through with my brother last night, and we were saying like you know Andre Pollard was he was very good throughout. I think he he probably suffered a little bit Andre Pollard because Faf de Clerk didn't really give him the ball that much, so he he ended up playing a fairly safe kind of a contest. It was a very strong out uh, World Cup for him, but just just didn't jump out. Richie Munga was was good as well. Like with Owen Farrell and George Ford, you know, they swapped around a little bit. Uh, they were both, I suppose, quietened down in the final quite a bit. And that just took it away a little bit for me as well. And then someone like, I just thought Tamura beating heart of that Japan team, they gave us such beautiful rugby. And I decided to go with him in the end there. Like Fukuoka has had a great tournament as well, but does that show up a lack of quality at outside centre? Uh, possibly, like, I mean, like actually moved a winger in. If Tuilangi hadn't been so quiet, I think in the final, or if South Africa hadn't made him so quiet mm. in the final, he definitely would have been in there. Um, now a lot of people have made the very very valid point of I should probably just put Randrandra in the centre rather than Fukuoka uh, and swap them around because Randrandra actually does play a bit in the centre as well. And give Cheslin Colby the fourteen jersey or give. Uh, oh no, I still would have had Fukuoka on the on the wing. It's just swap the two of them around. Like there are other people talking about Cheslin Colby. Murray in Madrid says Colby and Faf have to be there. Um, Shin Finn ninety says Faf and Pollard. Uh, Oshin Cleary, a winger at 13, no chance. Uh, Lafayella, maybe, yeah, he was definitely a contender as well. Faf at 9. Hori, Umbanambi, George, and Taylor all had better World Cups than Latu. Colby over Adams. Oshin's taken me to the cleaners. If you had to put MVP in brackets beside one of those, <sighs> um, I talk going into the final, it was between Curry and Peter Steff. So, so Peter Steff is uh, player of the tournament. Yeah. Put it to you this way. Who is the best player, skill-wise, doesn't matter who they play for in that team? Randrandra. I was about to say, yeah. He, he really he's, is. He's the best player in the world. Yeah. Like, as, as I was saying when I was going through it, a lot of people, despite the fact that he didn't even make it out of the pool stages, a lot of people were saying he was their favourite player at the entire tournament. Good to see a monster man in the team as well. Oh, had to put him in there, yeah. Oh, no, I mean, he was unbelievable. Like, I think it was the top tackles, uh, or top carries, I think, for uh, South Africa, and uh, really high in their tackle count as well. Uh, anyone else there? George Ford at 10. A bit of English hate there, Neil, I think. Certainly not, Chris. That's what Chris is saying. I was talking up England so much last week to the point where I think I finished one of the shows and I was going, am I actually doing a bit of an England love in here? Uh, am I, have, I'd, I'd have a deep, dark look at myself. Have I accidentally, unfortunately, <laughs> jinxed England? Oh, what a, oh, what a tragedy that would be. Oh, what a fool I am. <laughs> <laughs> Surely some referee has to make this team. Some of them has a, some of them had had great games for certain teams from Andrew. Oh, I see what you did there, Andrew. That was very clever. Uh, best referee at the World Cup? I give it away in Barnes. Wayne Barnes for me yeah, as well, yeah. I think so, yeah. Uh, that is an actual award as well. He, he, did, he, he, he did win the official it, award. Yeah. I do find that astonishing that there is a referee of the of the tournament award given out at the end of the rugby world. I did find it a pity for Wayne Barnes actually, though it's like it's assumed he is going to be retiring after this, and it means he'll never have got to referee a World Cup final because of the of the four World Cups he'll have been to. England will have been to the final and two of them, and this would have been his chance, I think, to get a final. And ultimately, England got there ahead of him. Yeah, he wasn't able to do it. Those damn All Blacks let him down. I know. The yeah. All Blacks Wayne Barnes relationship has uh, written another chapter. Absolutely. So before we finish up, own your own final thoughts. Having been back a couple of weeks, you have a time to reflect on your time over there. Personal highlights, favorite players you saw, places you were. I'm a, a huge admirer of uh, Faf de Klerk in terms of uh, I've never seen him play in the flesh until the Rugby World Cup probably helps that a man of my stature gets to admire, you know, uh, <laughs> another, another fella who's uh, vertically challenged. It was, he was amazing. He was absolutely sensational. All you have to do is hit the gym on. All the... Uh, it starts now. <laughs> all the... Um, the Jap well, not all the... A fair selection of the Japanese players were unbelievable. That, that, that evening in Oita, watching Fiji take on Wales as well, unbelievable. Just that, that Fijian team, the neutrals choice, but Japan did their very best to take that title and probably successfully did take that title after what they did against Scotland. It's hard to get away from the, for me, New, New Zealand against South Africa on the second day of the tournament, uh, Wales against Fiji, just this insane game, uh, and Japan against Scotland, three of my highlights of the entire tournament. And then, of course, that brief 90 seconds at the start of Ireland against New Zealand where there was this brilliant sporting <laughs> coliseum atmosphere uh, where the sides were drawing for a while.
we held him for full 90 seconds. There, there, there. I was, it was longer than that, in fairness. What was it, three minutes? It was five, like seven, five, seven, maybe? I don't know. It was short enough that it's not even worth actually mentioning. No. But, you, uh, you can call it 90 seconds, and no one's really going to correct you because, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, who, who is going to do that? I can, I, Look, 2023. Ireland will be back. Well, the one thing we do know is that teams will want to avoid us in the next World Cup because if you beat Ireland, you end up losing your next game. Is that's that is the, true. That's how the trend has gone. So yeah. we are to be feared, Neil. Unless you're, unless you're Japan. They beat us and they won their next game. Yeah, but it wasn't a knockout one, was it? So it <laughs> doesn't count. All right. Thanks a million for stopping by and uh, great stuff in thanks, Japan Neil. as well. Great stuff for yourself. Congratulations. And uh, mind those, those people pelting you with abuse after your team of the, of the tournament. Exactly, yeah. Full body armour walking out the door. So that's it. A big thanks to everyone who's watched, listened and given comments over the last uh, few weeks. A lot of work gone into the show. I want to say thanks to uh, Dahi Boland who has produced this series and to our vision mixers uh, on the desk today is David Nolan. That's it from the Rugby World Cup show here on Off The Ball. Thanks for watching and listening and we'll speak to you again soon.